Friends, this is a very important video. In the strongest possible terms, I need to expose what American gospel has done. This is a great example of what Jesus rebukes when he spoke to the religious leaders and said, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. This is Michael Brown, and I want to give you a little context for this video. I participated with Sam Storms in a roundtable discussion with Justin Peters and Jim Osmond talking about false teachers, false teaching, very candid, open discussion over four hours that was released by American Gospel with our approval and blessing, all four of us. And one of the things that I pressed in the video was what I felt were very clear double standards. God hates unequal weights and measures. And I was saying, you know, you'll attack a charismatic leader for saying one thing and, 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 and having one practice and write that person off as a false teacher, false prophet, but you'll excuse all kinds of things among people that you love or admire or respect, etc. So in pressing that, there was uh, an interesting dialogue that took place. I, I pressed them earlier in the broadcast and they pressed us. It was back and forth. It was fair, open, honest in that way. They pressed us about different people. We responded. I press them going through some of the horrific anti-Semitic writings of Martin Luther, and they would not write him off. They would not say he shouldn't be in ministry, false teacher, etc. Well, then later in the broadcast, uh, later in the discussion, I came back to it. So I want to play this first clip. This is me reading further quotes from Martin Luther. Here's what we said. Please just hear these quotes. You didn't know who's saying them. All right. Uh, almost every night when I wake up, the devil is there and wants to dispute with me. I have come to this conclusion. When the argument that the Christian is without the law and above the law doesn't help, I instantly chase the devil away with a fart. Let's continue. Um, every Christian is by faith so exalted above all things that by virtue of a spiritual power, he is Lord of all things without exception so that nothing can do him any harm. As a matter of fact, all things are made subject to him or are compelled to serve him in obtaining salvation. Both quotes Martin Luther. Like the mules who will not move unless you perpetually whip them with rods, so the civil powers must drive the common people, whip, choke, hang, bird, burn, behead, and torture them, that they may learn to fear the powers that be. A peasant is a hog, for when a hog is slaughtered, it is dead. In the same way, the peasant does not think about the next life, for otherwise he would behave very differently. On the obstinate, hardened, blinded peasants, let no one have mercy, but let everyone as he is able, you, stab, slay, lay about him as though among mud dogs, so that peace and safety may be maintained. And in response to the death of over 100,000 peasants that he was alleged to have incited, it was I, Martin Luther, who slew all the peasants in the insurrection, for I commanded them to be slaughtered. All their blood is upon my shoulders, but I cast it upon the Lord our God, who commanded me to speak in this way. Okay, this now is how Jim Osmond and Justin Peters responded to that. So at least using the same criteria that you've used for Copeland's quotes, for Sid not being in ministry, would you agree that Martin Luther, and again, just a tiny selection, these are all his quotes, should not have been in ministry and should be branded a false teacher? I would say, given those quotes, if, if we were in a situation where Luther was alive today and he were writing and saying these things, I would agree with you and say he should not be in ministry. He should shut it down and go sit under somebody who's a sound teacher and, and, and stop with this nonsense. Okay. I would want that silence. I would agree. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. I would want that silence. Right. So based on that, they said that if this was Martin Luther, if he was alive today, that that person, that he should not be in ministry that someone who said those things and taught those things should not be in ministry, rather they should be sitting under someone receiving the truth and getting grounded. Well, uh, to my real dismay, uh, after this video was put out on the American Gospel YouTube channel, there was a response from Chris Roseboro uh, about the sins of Martin Luther. Now, I don't, I don't know Chris personally, but every so often I'll be sent clips from him and people want me to respond, and I don't. But I found his attacks often to be unethical. I found them to be slanderous. And I felt them very commonly to be uh, unequal weights and measures where he will give a pass to someone that he agrees with and completely write off someone that he disagrees with. And when any of us do that in any direction, <clears throat> uh, for, 
in any ministry we're doing, it's, it's ugly, it's wrong in God's sight. Proverbs 7, 15, 17, 15 says that to, to acquit the guilty or to condemn the innocent, both are detestable in God's sight. Again, the sin of straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. So I want to play a few representative excerpts here where Chris is downplaying the severity. He's, he's not justifying, <clears throat> but he is downplaying the severity of Luther's sins. Let's listen to the first clip. The issue, though, is is that Dr. Brown brings up several of the things that Luther said, and he brings them up out of context. And the, the historical context is absolutely necessary to understand what's going on here. So in Luther's criticism of the Jews of his day, his focus was primary, primarily theological. And he even cri criticizes the Jews of his day of somehow uh, basically engaging in a form of of a racial superiority, as if somehow being a child of Abraham made you racially superior to others. This doesn't let Luther off the hook, though, but we must recognize a few things, and that is, is that Luther legitimately believed that with the recovery of the gospel, you know, having been papered over by Rome for so many centuries, uh, with the recovery of the gospel and, and the true proclamation of salvation by grace through faith alone by Jesus Christ, the son of David, Luther legitimately ultimately held out a, a hope and a belief, and even it rose to a level of expectation that he expected that with the recovery of the gospel that it would lead to many people who are Jewish, uh, both genetically as well as religiously, that it would cause them to reconsider Jesus as the Messiah, and that he believed that would, that would lead to many Jews being saved. And when that didn't turn out to be the case, um, Luther, I think, lashed back in a way that was beyond what was necessary and crossed into the line of sinfulness. All right. Notice his words. I think he lashed out in a way that, that, that it crossed lines into sinfulness. And notice the claim, notice the claim that what I said was out of context. Okay. And this is, this is mind boggling to me as a Jewish believer who studied these things for decades and has interacted with church scholars for decades, it's interacted with rabbis in the Jewish community for decades. The, these statements are mind boggling, but just notice the same gentleman who will bash in the strongest terms and, and with mocking nicknames and things like that, charismatics that he differ with, differs with. Yeah, I, I think Luther crossed over into that would be sinful, but I'm quoting him out of context. All right, back to Chris. I would note the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, I was a member of the Missouri Synod for decades. Uh, back a while ago, they actually put out an official statement where they made it very clear that uh, what Luther said in regards to his anti-Semitism, that it crossed the line into sin. And so we recognize that uh, we are all creatures of the era that we live in. And when Luther called uh, for the censure of Jews and for the silencing of them, and also you know, in his you know his participation in the princes and putting down the peasants' revolt, we must recognize that Luther was saying these things and calling for these things not in the context of a constitutional republic. Instead, Luther was a citizen of the Holy Roman Empire, which in his day, uh, which is the closest thing that we can point to in basically say that uh, Luther may have been a Christian nationalist. He, he, he believed that the monarch should be Christian and that his, uh, his uh, sword should be used to put down false doctrine, false teaching, and threats not only to the nation, but also to the Christian church. And as a result of it, there was no real separation of church and state in the time of Luther, and Luther didn't think in those categories. And so as a result of it, when Luther was had a theological Logical issue with the Jews, he also believed that Jews theologically were a threat to the Christian to, to the Christian Church, which is part of the driving reason why he said some of the things he did. He didn't see them as uh, primarily as a civil enemy. He saw them as a religious enemy. And I would note he's not wrong. Ah, uh -huh. okay. So Luther crossed the line into sin. You're about to hear from Luther in a moment. He crossed the line into sin. He spoke of the censure and silencing of, of Jews. <clears throat> He's a product of his time. And he was a Christian nationalist. By the way, the same way that Nazis were Christian nationalists, ultimately, the way the thing pans out, as, as you'll see. And he saw the Jews as a theological threat, which they were. In other words, look, he crossed the line into sin. And I, I, th I think he went a little too far. But uh, 
And of course, we don't justify the, gen- the Holocaust or anything. But look, he, you know, they, he did. They, it was true. They were a theological threat. So let's let's just listen one more quote from Chris, and then I'm just going to let you hear from Martin Luther and see if this is a classic example of straining out on that, swallowing a candle, or right, so justifying or downplaying the sins of Luther while exaggerating the the sins of charismatics and others that Chris differs with, and that this is. On American Gospel. American Gospel put this out to my absolute shock and dismay. And I told them in the plainest terms, this was wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, back to Chris one more time. Uh, the, the, uh, the Judaism of today and even the Judaism of the medieval period uh, is, is exactly the same false Judaism that the Pharisees had created and was responsible, you know, primarily for, you know, for the crucifixion of Christ. And so we recognize that unbelieving Jews today are not, uh, they, they, they are not neutral as it relates to Jesus Christ. Instead, they are o- overt enemies of Christianity and the saving message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah promised of the Old Testament, that he is the promised son of David, the promised prophet that Moses prophesied about in Deuteronomy 18, and that we must listen to him and that salvation is only in him. Modern day Jews oppose this 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 gospel vehemently. And so as a result of it, like every other world religion, uh, modern Judaism is an enemy of Christianity and must be countered with sound biblical reasoning, as well as with love and temperance and respect. And so that's where Luther, I think, crossed the line. Uh, that's where Luther, I think, crossed the line. It wasn't temperance and respect. <clears throat> and, and notice this bizarre notion that Jews today are all inex- inextricably bound up in opposing the gospel and hating the gospel. Your average Jew doesn't even think about Jesus. Your average Jew doesn't think about the gospel. Your average Jew has Christian friends. It's just not Christian themselves. And it's ultra-Orthodox Jews. Ultra-Orthodox Jews, they would be the ones that would most strongly oppose the gospel. But most of the gospel that they know is the gospel of Luther and the Holocaust, the gospel of the Crusades and the Inquisitions, the, the gospel that's a false gospel. So there's this ongoing mischaracterization of Jews' Judaism as everyone is hostile to the gospel and opposing it with all their might. And hey, Luke, Luther saw them as the theological threat. He just stepped over the line. As for Luther and the Holocaust, one more clip from Chris, and then I will just read you Martin Luther and read you what Holocaust scholars have to say. One more clip. Dr. Brown also mentioned that people used Luther's quotes out of context for the justification of the uh, of the Holocaust. But here's the thing. Uh, Luther did not advocate for the systematic murder of six million Jews, and no Christian at all should ever advocate for such a thing. And instead, we should see it as the lamentable murder of, as, of, of people contrary to what uh, governments are called to do. As a result of it, you know, just because the Nazis misquoted Luther or tried to incite, uh, you know, uh, the, their, their, their own brand of socialist nationalism uh, for the purpose of exterminating people. We as Christians recognize historically that not, that only was that an evil act on the part of the Nazis, it's an uncharitable use of Martin Luther. And I would note that uh, do your historical research on this, and that is, is that the Nazis didn't primarily get their idea ideas for the, for the uh, Holocaust from Martin Luther, far from it. Instead, they got it from a British philosopher uh, who was famous in the day. I would uh, refer you to uh, the, the rise and fall of the Third Reich for more details on that if you want to do your historical uh, research. Yeah, candidly, this is all reprehensible and terribly, terribly disappointing. An uncharitable use of Luther. I never said Luther caused the Holocaust, but his writings did contribute to the death of millions of Jews. So you tell me if I exaggerated my position on Luther. You, you tell me if you could justify someone like this being in ministry, founding a whole movement, etc., with rhetoric like this. First, let's put an image up. So I'll just leave the image up the entire time so you can see it. This is a, this is a pig. This is in front of a church in Wittenberg. There's a pig and there are people suckling at the pig's nipples and there's a, there's a rabbi looking at the pig's behind to try to s- see if the king's pig is defecating. And Luther says this. Well, now, I, I don't know in detail where they got it from, but I can guess approximately here in Wittenberg in our parish church, there was a, a sow carved into the stone under which lie young pigs and Jews 
who are sucking. This is in front of a church. This is what Jews know about the gospel in many cases, that this is what Christians do. Behind the sow stands a rabbi who is lifting up the right leg of the sow, raises the behind of the sow, bows down and looks with great effort into the Talmud, the most sacred books of traditional Judaism, under the sow as if he wanted to read and see something most difficult and exceptional. For among the Germans, it is said of someone who pretends to great wisdom without good cause. Where did he read that? On the behind of the sow. And Luther says that crudely. So he's, he's talking about this image and just explaining it. Yeah, it's this Christian image of this rabbi looking as a pig defecates. This is the coarseness, carnality of Luther. And, and just the junk that came out of his mouth. Like, here's one. I am like ripe S word. And the world is a gigantic a-hole. We probably will let go of each other soon. Just, just picture your favorite TV preacher using quotes like that. A uh, Luther scholar, Eric W. Gritch, also noted that there is even a hint of racism in Luther when he commented on the unsubstantiated rumor that Jews killed Christian children. This crime, quote, still shines forth from their eyes and their skin. We are at fault in not slaying them, meaning the Jews. Such a declaration, Gritch says, cannot be limited to a specific historical context. It is timeless and means death to the Jews whether this uttered by Luther or Adolf Hitler. Moreover, Luther himself was willing to, quote, kill a blaspheming Jew. I would slap his face, Luther said, and if I could, fling him to the ground and in my anger, pierce him with my sword. So said Martin Luther. Now from his 1543 book concerning the Jews and the laws. Yes, later Lutherans repudiated this. I fully understand it. It was more rediscovered in the 1800s when complete sets of his works were put out in German. And then the Nazis, of course, utilized it. This is Martin Luther. Therefore, be on your guard against the Jews. There's nothing out of context. I did not quote Luther out of context. He's writing to the princes of Germany. Therefore, be on your guard against the Jews, knowing that wherever they have their synagogue, nothing is found but is a den of thieves, a den of thieves in which sheer self-glory, conceit, lies, blasphemy, and defaming of God and men are practiced most maliciously and vehemently uh, his eyes on them, vehemming his eyes on them. So you go to a synagogue, Jews are praying to God. Read the prayer book. Read the Jewish prayer book. This is how Luther characterizes it. He says this, Moreover, they, the Jews, are nothing but thieves and robbers who daily eat no morsel and wear no thread of clothing, clothing with they, which they have not stolen and pilfered from us by means of their accursed usury. Thus they live from day to day together with wife and child by theft and robbery, as arch thieves and robbers in the most impenitent security. No, one should toss out these lazy rogues by the seat of their pants. Luther wrote this, 1543. Hitler reprinted it, the Nazis, with joy. And remember, Luther had a massive impact on Germany, German culture, German language, German history, massively impacted by Martin Luther. Luther said this, what shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews, since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct now that we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. If we do, we become sharers in their lives, cursing and blasphemy. Thus, we cannot extinguish the unquenchable fire of divine wrath of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert the Jews. With prayer and the fear of God, we must practice a sharp mercy to see whether we might save at least a few from the glowing flames. We dare not avenge ourselves. Vengeance a thousand times worse than we could wish them already has them by their throat. I shall give you my sincere advice. First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is Luther in context, in context, giving counsel to the princes of Germany. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, blasphemy. And he goes on. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. And, and this is what Chris is defending. Well, he stepped over the line. He apparently crossed over into sin here and, and he's being used uncharitably by the Nazis. No, they're doing exactly what he said. I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Instead, they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn like gypsies. Oh, the Nazis did this to a T. Third, I advise that their prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught be taken from them. Fourth, 
I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. You hear that? Luther is saying they are forbidden to teach under, under penalty of death. What's taking this out of context, friends? How can any Christian leader look you in the eye and not say this is deplorable, despicable, inexcusable? Chris says, well, we don't know if Luther repented of these sins, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter because if you just prayed the Lord's Prayer, forgive our sins, it's generically forgiven. We're not like Catholics. You've got to confess every sin and be forgiven of every sin. What I find remarkable is that in the dialogue we have with, with Justin Peters and Jim Osmond, which is a fair dialogue. We want everyone to watch it. We encourage you to watch it. That, that Benny Hinn was brought up that he, he said there are nine gods. I said he made a comment one, one Sunday morning. Immediately, that, that within the Trinity, there's Father, Son, and Spirit. Each is like uh, tripartite, so it's like nine gods. He made a ridiculous, stupid comment. Elders in his church spoke to him. He fixed it that night, and Justin Peter said, we didn't see sufficient repentance of that, etc. Well, where's the sufficient repentance of Luther? Come on, equal weights and measures. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct of the highways be abolished completely for the Jews. Sixth, I advise that usury be permitted to, per, prohibited to. That's how they made their money, by loans and charging interest. Seventh, I command putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews. I mean, reduce them to slave labor, just as the Nazis did. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Uh, in, in his important study, um, Hitler's willing executioners, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen points out that one leading Protestant church from Bishop Martin Zasse published a compendium of Martin Luther's anti-Semitic vitriol shortly after Kristallnacht's orgy of anti-Jewish violence. In the forward to the volume, he applauded the burning of the synagogues and the coincidence of the day on November 10th, 1938, on Luther's birthday, the synagogues are burning in Germany. The German people, he urged, ought to heed these words of the greatest anti-Semite of his time, the warner of his people against the Jews. When Julius Streicher, one of Nazis' top henchmen and publisher of the anti-Semitic Sturmer, was asked during the Nuremberg war trials if there was any other publication in Germany which treated the Jewish question in an anti-Semitic way, Streicher said, Dr. Martin Luther would very probably sit in my place in the defendant's dock today if this book had been taken into consideration by the prosecution. In the book, The Jews and Their Lives, Dr. Martin Luther writes that the Jews are a serpent's brood and what should burn down their synagogues and destroy them. That's what the Nazis said on Kristallnacht. Many historians say this is the beginning of the, the Holocaust, November 9th, 1938. That's when they set the synagogues on fire said, uh, and destroyed Jewish homes and places of business. They were following exactly what Luther said. Historians know this. No one denies this. Uh, let me keep going. Kurt Hendel, professor emeritus of Reformation history at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, said the Nazis saw Luther as a hero because of his virulent 1543 treatise on the Jews and their lives. They very clearly used Luther's writings that had all this anti-Semitism in them to support their cause. And he, and he told this to religious news service, noting the treatise called for Jews to be expelled from German cities, synagogues to be burned down and rabbis forbidden to preach. Dr. William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury. It is easy to see how Luther prepared the way for Hitler. And Adolf Hitler, I do insist on the certainty that sooner or later, once we hold power, Christianity will overcome and the German church be established. Yes, the German church without a pope and without the Bible. And Luther, if he could be with us, would give us his blessing. Last quote, famous historian Paul Johnson, his book, History of the Jews. Luther was not content with verbal abuse. Even before he wrote his anti-Semitic pamphlet, he got Jews expelled from Saxony in 1537. And in the 1540s, he drove them from many German towns. He tried unsuccessfully to get the elected to expel them from Brandenburg in 1543. His follower Melanchthon wanted them expelled from all German territory. Luther's tract on the Jews and their lives is full of revolting invective, even by the standards of the 16th century. He called on Christians to burn Jewish synagogues and schools, destroy their houses, confiscate their Talmuds and prayer books, forbid their rabbis to teach on pain of death, uh, death abolish their safe conducts in the highways, prohibit usury, and compel them to do manual labor. Luther thus became the John the Baptist of Adolf Hitler. And Chris Roseborough, an American gospel, downplay it. Yeah, he sinned cross lines, but I took him out of context. And the Nazis really didn't use his material. It didn't influence him all that much. And, and to say he was a false teacher or shouldn't have been in ministry is a wrong conclusion. Just remember that the next time these men attack a charismatic brother or sister for preaching prosperity 
or for giving some wacky vision. Just remember, these are the ones that downplay the sins of Martin Luther. That's despicable. It's unequal weights. It's unequal measures. And they need to be rebuked openly for that.